Hey guys, I'm Comic Well. What's up? This is Gigi. I am here at San Diego Comic Con 2015, and I am joined by two awesome guys. This is Jackson Lansing, and this is Colin Kelly, and they are the writers of Hacktivist, and this is a cyber graphic novel. And who better to tell you about it than the men themselves? So, Jackson, why don't you tell us like a little brief description of exactly what Hacktivist is? Sure. Uh, Hacktivist is the story of two friends, uh, Nate and Ed, who definitely aren't based on Colin and I, uh, who are uh, the heads of a massive uh, social media organization called Your Life. Uh, it's kind of like Facebook meets Twitter, but like it blew them both out of the water. Uh, however, in their off time, these two are actually cyber vigilantes. They are sitting there with all of this Twitter data and they are essentially utilizing it to uh, help uh, establish revolutions overseas, to help people who are being stepped on by their governments, uh, to help uh, increase cyber freedom around the world. And uh, volume one really is all about them coming under the uh, pressure of the US government and getting splintered apart by that. And volume two is about what happens next. Oh, awesome. Okay. And now there was a big name kind of connected to this. And I know you guys refer to it as the creator, the creative mind behind this. And this was Alyssa Milano, as everybody knows, Samantha from Who's of Us. So how She's exactly, in this project. She's I know, I already write. How exactly did you get hooked up with Alyssa? Well, it was her idea originally. Um, she basically, Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, is the godfather of her son. And she herself is a UNICEF ambassador. So her head was already in the space of um, global activism and how that really connects to uh, you know the modern social media context. So she was thinking, well, what if Jack Dorsey was a member of Anonymous? And what would that mean? That was the idea, that was the kernel that she brought to Boom. And they were smart enough to be like, oh my God, this story is something that has to be told. Um, we had a previous ex existing uh, relationship with them. They they brought us in and we actually got to sit down with Alyssa, which is a big dream for us because she's Alyssa Milano. You get that call that's like, <laughs> so hey, do you want to write a comic book with Arkea? And we were like, well, all we want to do is write a comic book with Arkea. And they're like, do you want to write a comic book with Alyssa Milano? And I fainted, right? You're like, you're like what? Uh, and then and, and yeah, we got to sit down. That's so funny because I was actually going to say, who got that call? Like, where were you guys uh, when that. that happened? I got that call. Um, I, I got that call. Uh, Arkea had been uh, Rebecca Taylor, who was the editor on the first volume, uh, and also the second until recently. Uh, she just moved over to DC. She. Uh, had read Freak Show, uh, which was a, a very small press graphic novel that I co-wrote uh, with a, a very good friend of Colin and I's David Server. Um, really good book, if you can find it, hard to find, but we're really proud of it. Um, she had read that, and so she came to me and was like, hey, would you, you know, and Colin, because I know you guys are working together a lot, do you guys want to do this with us? And uh, I immediately called Colin, I was like, this is the weirdest thing I'm ever gonna ask you, but do you want to do a comic book with Alyssa Milano? Uh, did you believe him at all? That, or did you think he was full of your leg? It was like, okay, very funny. You were watching like TV land, like reruns and you got inspired. You've had a little too much to drink. Like you what mean, exactly? You a comic book about Alyssa Milano? <laughs> exactly. The craft, who's the boss? It's going to be a graphic novel. So what was like when he told you that? Like how long did it take you for it to actually sink in? I mean, I kind of lost my mind a little bit because like who believes this? But they were like, no, no, no. The meeting is set for Thursday. Come on in. We're going to all sit down with over dinner and a, at a table very similar to this. We sat down with Alyssa Milano. Yeah, we didn't have the job. We, okay. this was a pitch. Yeah, we, uh, had to, we had to talk to Alyssa, and once we sat down with her, though, and kind of got how passionate she was and how, how much thought she'd already put into this, she convinces us. And then once we were like, oh my God, we really share the same vision here, then the walls kind of broke down. Now, I mean, like, we get to go to Alyssa Milano's Christmas parties. <laughs> like, and she's- Do you get a plus one? <laughs> <laughs> she's the greatest. She's, um, they're, <sighs> Here's how we knew she was real serious. We sat down and we we talked about, for about two hours over lunch, she, she took time off set to come and talk to us. Uh, and we sat there and talked about how the, uh, how Facebook data collection was gonna become a real problem, uh, not just in dictatorial nations where that can be used against them uh, by like other powers and in those nations used against civilian activists, uh, but how it was gonna become a problem in the United States. And at some point or another, we were probably gonna learn that Facebook and Twitter and Google and all these organizations had been collaborating with the government and selling you know, our, our data and doing a bunch of data collection. Like that was probably gonna you know, come out fairly soon. It, it really felt like that was on the horizon. And that was about three years ago. Yeah, this was about six months before anyone knew the name Edward Snowden. Uh, we were talking about it, we were like, wow, she really, cares and really gets it. And that was the, when we told her like, we're interested in a book about hackers, but kind of only if we really get to write about the, the international scope and scale of what that really means, rather than like hack the planet, right? Like we weren't looking to like surf through the internet. We were looking to tell a story about what was actually happening. And uh, she totally bought in, talked to us about theory for like two hours. Uh, we left the thing. 
uh, we get a call that we get the that we got the job that she loved us and she wanted to do the book with us. <laughs> we, did this dance. Yeah, we, did the, we did the we got a job dance, and then we uh, and then we go home and sitting on both we call each other as soon as we get this. Um, sitting at the doorstep of both of our houses is a is a leather folio about Massive. big about this big with a big metal like claw like l latch, and you open it up and inside is a little note fr from Alyssa that's just like. Have fun, and inside of it is uh, fifty to seventy-five pages of copy. Or more, like yeah. it was literally everything that Alyssa had been hand photocopying, highlighting everything she'd been collecting since this idea had started with her. And she gave us this, all of her research. And we're like, wow, this isn't just something you've been noodling on a little bit. Like this is literally something she's been collecting all sorts of data on. And we're like, wow, this this woman is serious. And this is this is our research. And it was thrilling to have a, collabor a collaborative partner with so much uh, passion for it. And we got to jump in and really got to tell a story. I know how exciting to work with somebody that everybody knows the name and they know what they're good at, know them for that. Yeah. But to be able to have somebody that really put the thought in behind it had to be a great feeling. So I was going to say, what would be the most surprising part about working with somebody like her? But that sounds like that was kind of it. Is the, the fact? Yeah, the most surprising thing about this is that normally, and again, this isn't a bad mouth, the, the concept of celebrity right, books. Right. But in comics, I think part of the, Part of the thing you run into with celebrity books is that they can run a gamut between this is something that you are doing and putting my name on, and this is something I am doing. And this is something Alyssa was doing. It, it was not a matter of like, oh, this is a vanity project. This is a story she really wanted to tell, because we wouldn't have done it if it was. Mm -hmm. She was feeling us out, we were feeling her out. Mm -hmm. And when we realized like, oh, she cares. She wants to do this. Mm -hmm. And she realized we care and we want to do this. We, She's been an excellent partner in all of that. I mean, uh, we must be the, I think that the big, the, the, probably the most surprising thing is like, we must be the only people in the world that get regular emails from Alyssa that are just like, check out this crazy cyber crime that just happened in <laughs> Russia. It's like she, like Alyssa keeps us up to date about cyber crime. So, but then the interesting thing is, as we're kind of moving into volume two, we're looking at more domestic issues. And we realize like, you know, already we, you know, we've clashed a little bit with members of Anonymous who maybe, you know, aren't thrilled by what we're doing. And so far we have also supporters and they've really backed us up. But by in volume two, by looking at the domestic issues, you know, I mean, our country is rife with a lot of real issues and it's a lot of dangerous stuff. Now we all know the name Edward Snowden. Now we all know the name Edward Snowden. We kind of get this stuff and it's like, well, if we're going to do this, we're going to piss a lot of people off. Can I? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> we are going to piss a lot of people off. And we're like, Alyssa, are you ready for that kind of flack? And she just kind of sits us down and she's like, I am Alyssa Milano. Do you know how much flack I've taken? Did you see Poison Ivy? <laughs> you guys don't even know, let's cause a ruckus. Yeah, yeah that's and exciting. Telling, and having Alyssa Milano tell you that it's okay to throw down mm -hmm. gives you, it's like you have a, a super awesome elephant or gorilla in the room. Yeah. I've got to say, for anybody that hasn't read any of your work, like just hearing you guys speak, I think is something that's going to make everybody want to go out and get it. Because if you tell stories about your own lives this way, I can't imagine when you have the uh, liberty oh, to be able to tell to make, some actual yeah, stories. Yeah. Or you get to make things up. Because like, if this is your actual real life and yeah. it's this entertaining, yeah. you know, that's now you guys are friends in real life. Right. So um, at Comic Wow, we have a lot of us that are within the team that are actually friends in real life. So I know that sometimes that can be a blessing and sometimes that can be a curse. So exactly which side, and you know, be honest in front of each other, which yes. side would you say that airs on or is it a 50-50 as far as, is it more, let me give you this question first. Is it more motivating to have you working with a friend as far as like, oh, they keep me on my game because they're my friend? Mm -hmm. Or is it more like, okay, it's a little easier to like slack off a bit because you know, we're friends, we're not just business oh, partners. Uh, the, the former entirely. Uh, there's no slack off to what we do, like uh, ever. Uh, and, and part of that is the fact that we are friends, but we're also writers. So we're very, you, you, you know, we, I think we have a pretty good way of turning the professional button on with each other when we need to write. There is a distinction between when Colin and I are hanging out as friends and when we are writing and they are not the same thing. So when you get to a point where you sit down to work, if we are just kind of screwing off and like messing around and talking about that movie we saw and geeking out about like, you know, it's a regular occurrence to be like, all right, so here's what, here's what I think is going to happen in Ant-Man. And then we'll like talk for like an hour about Ant-Man. Right? Been there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, but then it's like, well, you just wasted my time. Exactly. Right. And it's like, I care enough about Jackson's career that I don't want to waste his time. And he cares about me enough that he doesn't want to waste my time. So together we really can kind of team up and we push each other to get the work done. Because and then we geek out about Ant Man. And then we geek out. Oh, of course we geek out about Ant Man. 
Fine. Now, so, okay. So you got the word that a second volume was coming out now. So volume two we have, and you said this Best is six issues, ever. right? Yeah, six so six. how exciting, because obviously Thanks. that means success of the first one. And so you mentioned a little bit, but what's the difference gonna be now? What direction are we taking in the second volume that everyone can look forward to? So with the second volume, as I kind of mentioned, we're really looking at domestic issues. Um, the first volume saw our two, our two best friends basically split up on opposite sides of the world. Um, but this time around, they're gonna be kind of slowly coming back together. But at the same time, one of our characters is basically wedged in the belly of the NSA. And it's very hard to do anything when you're surrounded by America's greatest you know, cybersecurity organization. How do you be a hacker while everyone is watching over your shoulder? So taking a look at that while also exploring the contemporary issues of American society, you know, flip on the news. Like it's not just hacking. It's, I mean, the, <laughs> the, the stock exchange just was down for four hours yesterday because of technical issues. At the same time that United Airlines was down because of technical issues. Um, there are technical issues everywhere and they can be caused by anything. So first off, we're incredibly vulnerable. Just as a society, we're incredibly vulnerable from like a technological perspective. But we're also incredibly vulnerable from a societal perspective. Look what just happened in Baltimore. Look what's happening all over the country in terms of racial violence and police violence, in terms of our uh, gay rights, in terms of like all these things where the, the country is changing very rapidly and not everybody is entirely on board with changes and you will see people become reactionary. You will see people uh, do horrible things uh, in the name of being reactionary and that's that is the kind of exploit, to use hacking terminology, that is the kind of hack that you could, that, that, that if you can deploy that in the real world against the United States, if you could reasonably like do real harm to the country, not by taking down our technological system, but using our technological system to take down our culture, then you have a real problem. So what we were really interested in is, you know, our first book is in, in large part about the responsibility or frankly, the understanding that it's not our responsibility um, of Western hackers who were essentially social engineering in the Middle East, which was something that was happening during the Arab Spring. Um, we wanted to look at that and really be like, how messed up is that? And how much sort of white savior nonsense gets wrapped up in that, right? We got a, a lot of people read the first issue of Hacktivist and were like, ah, this looks like a white savior story. It's like, get to the end, that's the whole point. Like we are, we're taking that concept down. Mm -hmm. The second volume is uh, kind of about looking at the concept of uh, violent revolution and taking that concept down and really looking at like what is what's the what's the flaw at the heart of this ideology uh, inside the context of hacking so we're actually uh, the, the fun thing about hacktivist 2 because we get six issues and we get more time is beyond our core cast uh, we get to expand to four awesome new characters That's who are who are diverse and who are interesting and who are uh, not evil at all but are a hundred percent antagonists Furious. Yeah. That's the thing that we really want to key into with Hacktivist 2 is there's so much anger and there, anyone who's been looking around at the news, looking around at what's going on and just been furious and felt ineffectual and there's nothing you can do about it. Well, these new characters can do something about it and they're not, they're done waiting. They're done standing by and they're going to change this country for the better by any means necessary. Now a book that takes and, and takes a, a subject that is you know, something that literally is facing us, like you were talking about with all the issues like within, but it's also in the form of a graphic novel, so it is an entertainment. Which do you find yourself being drawn more to, towards, the category of educating people or entertaining people in this book? That is a really good question. Yes! Yeah. Happy dance! <laughs> it is the, yeah. it's the we, challenge of hacktivist. It's the challenge of hacktivist. Um, we, we can only tell emotional stories. We are always gonna tell stories from a character perspective. And it is fantasy, so it's not 100% education, but it is a topic worth speaking of. I mean, it's very, you know, and it is very educational. We want people to, we want to open people's eyes, but we are entertainers. Like, let's be real. Like, people want to, we want them to read this book. We want them to be thrilled. We want them to cry. Please cry. Like, that's what we want out of this. If at the end of the day, you know, your heart's racing, your eyes are open, you say, wow, what can I do what can I do? How can I get off, now that I've read this, what can I do in my community? What can I do in my town? That's amazing. Then we've done both. And that's yes. but, but I mean, I, I don't think we would ever presume to be able to effectively educate on this subject. Uh, we are not hackers, and we're not computer scientists, and we don't have the time to be- And it's fiction, not fact. So. Exactly. <laughs> Though we are skirting so close to fact. Closer to fact than, frankly, most comics do, because Part of the fun and point of comics is that you get to get away from reality. Hacktivist is reality, as much as we can make it. And then every once in a while, we're going to take that one step further and make it sci-fi, right? But there's nothing that happened, there's straight up nothing in volume two, the, I'm sorry, volume one, uh, that hasn't now happened in real life. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we're like, 
every every single thing we wrote is now been achieved by someone somewhere in the world. We have a huge hack in uh, in the third issue of Hacktivist One that is now an app that you can download and that is being deployed across the Middle East to help organize revolution and rebellion in these places. Like we we make stuff up and then quote unquote make stuff up and then it happens. Um, and there's no actual correlation. It's just when you're writing about that world, like you can't help but write something that's gonna happen. These guys are innovative. And I know you guys said, I heard I overheard you say before I interviewed that you guys write and, and dedicate two days a week now to writing Sundays and Thursdays. Yeah. And just based on the fire and passion I feel just emitting from you guys, it amazes me that you can contain yourself to two days a week because that's gotta be the hardest thing. Like I write myself and not comic books, but I know what it is. It's like writing's not something you can sit down and do. Yeah. It's something that you have to like, when it hits, you feel it. And I'm sure you guys have immense notes that you take over time. Sure. But when does the fun time ever happen for you guys? Like even at a San Diego Comic Con, you're here, it's work, it's still supposed to be fun, but when, when does fun time happen for Jackson uh, and Colin? Uh, I mean, honestly, not to be cheesy, but writing is fun. Like, that's the great thing about writing with your best friend when you're telling awesome stories that are, like, sweet, right? We're not, like, writing... I mean, we're writing stuff that's going to break... Obituaries. Right, exactly. <laughs> we're writing awesome comic books. Yeah. I mean, we get to sit down for two days a week and just write comic books. That's awesome. That's amazing. That's fun. And at a con like this, yeah, we're hustling. We want to sell you some books, yeah. but... We're talking with fans. We're talking with people who are passionate about comic books. Like, yeah, this is work, but I mean, like, oh no, I have to go to Comic Con for four days. Yeah. Well, how tragic! Exactly. Yeah, we, we, I think that's part of the thing is that as guys who do carry a day job and do hold down uh, like normal civilian lives outside of being writers, uh, the fact that it, I think what that has created for us is a world where writing is our vacation. Writing is our fun. Writing is the thing that we do that isn't work. So in the eventuality that eventually that's the thing we can do straight up, right? That is, I think, going to be a really interesting transition where it's like, oh, all of a sudden, this is the thing that we get to do during the day. But we haven't hit that point yet. So right now we're in this really weird honeymoon period that's lasted seven years. Well, if you guys could have the ability to talk to every single person at San Diego Comic Con, I swear to God, you would be selling every single book out in a heartbeat. Come, but come to the, boom booth. But the good news is, so yes, visit them at the Boom Booth if you are already in San Diego. But the good news about this is that's what you have people like Comic Well for is to spread the word about it. I, I do have one favorite off topic pop culture question I like to ask people. And are you guys familiar with the reality show, The Amazing Race? Uh, only like a little bit, right? So you get the concept. Used to watch it like all the time. Yeah. Okay. So here's your question. Mm -hmm. You have to be a pair of two. Mm. Do you pick as your partner each other or Alyssa Milano? <laughs> oh my. Oh, yeah. You're, uh, you are left behind. <laughs> stay, stay here, Colin. Alyssa and I are going to go win the race. Alyssa and I are going to win that race. All right, time to fight. Fighting time. All right, guys. Well, I guess we'll have to just tune in one day and see if that comes around. Hey, but thank you. Race. Yeah. Call them. Call them. Reach them through. Boom. But anyway, thank you guys so much for your time here. And um, we look forward to reading Hacktivist Volume 2, issues 1 through 6, which tell everybody where they can find out everything and pick up the book and where they can follow you on social media. Uh, you can pick up the book at your local comic book shop coming July 29th. 29th. July 29th. Very, very close. We're like almost there. It's really exciting. We've been working on it for a long time. We can't wait to show it to you. Marcus Toe absolutely killed this book. It's so good. Ian Herring's back, which is amazing because he's brilliant and he's over at Marvel and we didn't think we'd get him back and we did. Uh, Darren Bennett's doing the lettering again. The book's going to be awesome. 20, uh, 20, uh, 29th. And then... Uh, you can find us at our websites, uh, jacksonlansing.com, thecolinkelly.com, or at cpkelly, and at jacksonlansing on Twitter. All right, well, fantastic. Good luck to you guys with the rest of the con. And for Comic Wow, I'm Gigi, that's Jackson, that's Colin, and you're welcome. <laughs>